You're watching the legal breakdown. So, Glenn, we have a historic moment right now. Donald Trump has been indicted by the Department of Justice in the classified documents case. Um, a lot to, to talk about on this. So let's try to get through some of these questions here. First off, when will we know the charges? Yeah, so I don't expect we will know the charges until Donald Trump appears for his arraignment. That is his first court appearance after someone's been indicted. Um, that is scheduled for Tuesday. The only way we would know about the charges is if they leaked out somehow. Um, I would suspect at this point, Donald Trump and his attorneys don't even necessarily know what the charges are. They have just been told by the federal prosecutors that a grand jury has returned a criminal indictment against him. They apparently negotiated a turn in or a voluntary surrender date of Tuesday for his arraignment, his first court appearance. So Tuesday is likely the day absent any reliable leaks that we will first learn precisely what Donald Trump has been indicted for. OK, so then on Tuesday in Florida, is Donald Trump going to be arrested? Or are we likely to see a mugshot? How will this work out? He will technically be arrested. You know, anytime you're indicted and you need to be presented to a court, the law enforcement agency that has primary responsibility for the case, it would be the FBI in this instance, will arrest you, will book you. What booking involves is asking a series of questions, filling out some police paperwork. There will be an arrest photo or what's often referred to as a mugshot taken of Donald Trump. He will again be fingerprinted even though there was reporting he was fingerprinted last time he was arrested in New York State Court. Um, and he will be run through the ordinary arrest procedures. I don't suspect there will be anything that looks like a perp walk. I don't suspect we will see Donald Trump in handcuffs because when the prosecutors decide to allow a defendant to turn himself in at the police station or at the local FBI field office, there really is no need to handcuff the person who is being allowed to turn himself in. Yeah, he's going to be a pro at this whole process by the time this whole this whole indictment season is over. It's frequent flyer miles yeah, for all these Exactly, tests. exactly. Uh, Glenn, what are the implications of this case being in Florida? Does it make it more likely that Trump could get a friendly jury because it's in Florida? So let me start with this. Uh, as a legal matter, the federal prosecutors had to indict in the federal jurisdiction where they believed they had venue. What's venue? Fancy legal term for where did this defendant commit the lion's share of the criminal activity. That's where the, the prosecutors have venue. That's where the case has to be brought. It looks like there was an assessment by Jack Smith's team that even if Donald Trump did commit some crimes by taking these documents from Washington, D.C., he illegally retained them uh, in Florida. He, you know, moved the boxes around to conceal them when Federal authorities came a-calling looking to retrieve those documents, so he obstructed justice in Florida. He may have mishandled national defense information, which is a crime that we'll have to see if Jack Smith charged him with. That would be a crime that falls under the Espionage Act. But it looks like the federal authorities have decided Florida was the right place to indict him. Doesn't mean he won't ultimately also be indicted for some crimes that he committed in, in D.C. The other thing that this means, Brian, is that he will get a Florida jury. Now, what does that mean? First of all, I think the prevailing wisdom is Florida is Trump country and Washington, D.C. is not Trump country when it comes to the jury pool. But let me hasten to add, you know, I spent 30 years as a prosecutor picking juries. I picked a lot of juries. And, you know, Every juror has his or her own biases and predisposed ideas about some. They have party affiliation. Now, not every case has sort of political implications or overtones. This one certainly does. Here's my experience. When jurors are done the jury selection process, that's a process designed to give the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and the judge, the court, an opportunity to weed out jurors that cannot sit fairly and impartially and set aside their politics, set aside anything they've heard about the case reported in the media, set aside any preconceived notions they might have and decide the case based only on the evidence they, they see presented during the course of the trial. 
in my experience, the overwhelming majority of jurors take that legal responsibility deadly seriously. Indeed, they swear an oath. They take an oath when they're sworn in as jurors to decide the case based only on the evidence. And if they don't, technically they are in contempt of court. And I have from time to time seen a juror prosecuted for violating that oath. So, you know, the, the example that I hold fast to, and I think we've talked about this one before, is when Paul Manafort went to trial, right? Paul Manafort was the campaign chairman for Donald Trump, committed a whole bunch of crimes, was indicted. When he went to trial, there was a woman selected to sit on that jury who was a self-described MAGA, huge Trump fan. She said, actually, she gave an interview after the case was over. She said she wore her MAGA hat, as she was driving to court every day, she took it off, left it in the car, went and did her jury service, came back to her car, put her MAGA hat on and drove home. She said she's a huge fan of Donald Trump. So by extension, she didn't want to think Paul Manafort did anything wrong. But she said, notwithstanding my politics, I based my decision only on the evidence I saw introduced during the course of the Manafort trial. And I voted guilty because the evidence proved his guilt. So I had to set my politics aside. That is what I firmly believe the vast majority of jurors will do. But there's no denying that that jury pool will be you know, located in the heart of Trump country in Florida rather than in the heart of, you know, um, in the District of Columbia, where the overwhelming majority of the citizens and the voters and the prospective jurors are Democrats. Right. And and I would add, too, that even if he did have a friendly jury or a friendly jury pool, logic would suggest that the facts are so far out of his favor that it wouldn't matter anyway. But but Glenn, I did want to ask one point. And just to like game this out for a moment, what happens if there is some diehard Trump supporter who evaded the guardrails uh, that were put up during jury selection and made his way onto the jury and he's just hellbent on protecting Trump? Is there some mechanism here? What 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 is the process that would happen if the other jurors came forward and said, look, this this dude is just a, a, a diehard Trump supporter and we're never going to we're never going to change his mind. What a great question. I have dealt with juror disqualification questions at every stage of the criminal case. And there are two different um, sort of rules at play, depending on where the trial is. At the moment, there is an issue raised about one of the jurors refusing to follow the judge's instructions, like deciding a case based on politics rather than on the evidence. If it is while the trial is ongoing, before the jury begins its deliberations, it's a little bit easier to dislodge a juror who is showing himself or herself to be violating the judge's rules and deciding a case based on politics rather than evidence. If that matter is brought to a, the judge's attention, what happens is that everything comes to a grinding halt. I've been involved in these proceedings and you start to question the jurors one by one to find out what this one juror is saying, is doing. And obviously you question the juror himself or herself. And then the judge has a decision to make. Has this juror done something that disqualifies them from continuing to serve on the jury? You know, if so, that juror can be removed. You can actually proceed to a jury verdict with 11 jurors if you remove a juror. Um, the other thing, though, is once they begin deliberating, it becomes much more difficult to dislodge a juror who is violating the judge's rules or the judge's right. orders. Well, well, then then you run the risk of looking like you're taking out your you're cherry picking jurors so that you can get the uh, the ruling that you want. Exactly. You know, you just hit the nail right on the head. Appellate court opinions are full of criticism of judges who remove a juror during deliberations, if it looks like there is any possibility that the juror was removed because of their position on guilt or innocence. And the last thing any of us want to do is get rid of a holdout juror who happens to you know, believe that the evidence either proves guilt or fails to prove guilt. You know, you don't want to take every 11 to 1 jury that is struggling to reach a unanimous verdict and then just kick off the dissenter. That is not 
in the spirit of you know a requirement that verdicts be unanimous. So it is perilous for judges to remove a juror once they begin deliberations, but it has been done. It happened in one of my lengthy RICO trials where a juror began violating the judge's rules. We had to have a hearing. We had to conduct individual voir dire, individual questioning of all the jurors. And the judge concluded, yes, this juror was violating the court's rules. The juror was removed. Then the process is they bring an alternate back. Somebody who has heard the entire trial, but when the jury began deliberating, the judge will instruct that juror, listen, you're not done. Your jury service is not necessarily over. So please don't listen to any media accounts. Don't talk to anybody about the evidence in the trial you just sat through because you may need to come back in if we have to kick off a deliberating juror and substitute an alternate in. If they do that, and I've had this happen more than once in criminal trials, the judge then instructs the jury to begin deliberations anew. Mm -hmm. Pretend like you never deliberated. Start from scratch, from jump, from square one, and begin your deliberations all over again with this new alternate juror who has now been made a regular deliberating juror. It's a challenging position to get through and have it affirmed on appeal, but I've had it happen a couple of times, and each time it has been affirmed on appeal. And I do want to note for people watching, this is just gaming out an extreme example. I think we can find solace in the fact that these prosecutors and the court is very adept at finding people who aren't overtly partisan, and uh, and they know what questions to ask. And it's not like uh, it's not like someone is uh, is going to be able to you know pull the wool over their eyes if they've been doing this for years and years. So I think uh, I think people can generally see uh, people who have extreme partisan allegiances and would make sure, especially in this case, to, to uh, mitigate against that. Glenn, I know that we are going to be asked more times than we can count. Will this affect Donald Trump's ability to run for office? It depends on what the charges are. So there are a couple of criminal charges that if convicted, the authorized punishment that the judge can impose is a bar from holding office in the future. Treason is one of those crimes. Uh, insurrection is one of those crimes. Interestingly, um, seditious conspiracy is not. Um, I, I don't know that any of the offenses charged in the documents case will carry with it uh, an authorized punishment of uh, a prohibition from serving in federal office in the future. We're going to have to wait for the charges to be unsealed and see, but I suspect we're not going to see any charges that carry with it the possibility of banning him from holding office in the future. So this may be an actual impediment. It may be a political impediment if he is tried, certainly if he is convicted of felony offenses, but it won't necessarily be a legal impediment. Now, we're expecting the arraignment on Tuesday. When should we expect the trial to begin and how long should we expect that trial to last? So basically, just to game this out, when when should the whole process um, be completed from start to finish? Well, let's start with the law. The Speedy Trial Act says from the time you are arraigned in court on the indictment until the time you are expected to go to trial, believe it or not, 70 days. Now, has a federal case ever gone to trial in 70 days? No. That, now, that may be an overstatement. Perhaps one or two relatively simple, straightforward federal cases have gone to trial in 70 days. But, you know, that 70 day deadline is really only observed in the breach. Um, Any time, for example, a defense attorney says to the judge, judge, I need a little bit more time to do X. The speedy trial clock stops. It tolls. It pauses. And all of that time is subtracted from the 70 days. Anytime a motion is pending before the court, a motion filed by the defense or by the prosecution, the speedy trial clock stops. So here is that, that's the law, 70 days, but rarely does that happen. The rule of thumb is in the larger, more complex criminal cases, you can expect to see a trial, you know, um, set for about a year from the time the defendant is first arraigned in court which in Trump's case will be this Tuesday. It could be quicker. It could be six, eight, 10 months, but I think a year is a fair rule of thumb, which kind of puts us into the you know late spring, early summer of 2024 yeah. with a presidential trial in uh, 
that, that was a Freudian slip with the presidential election, you know, just a matter of months away, months away in November of 2024. So, you know, I feel like, you know, this is going to be coming right down to the wire. Yeah. So we have the Manhattan DA's case that's going to start in March. We have this case that could start uh, around June. So it is possible that Trump could be a convicted felon, could could even be in prison before the election even happens, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And okay. again, that becomes a practical impediment to holding office, but not a legal impediment. Yeah. All right, Glenn, let's finish off with this. You know, you and I have done this series, I believe we're 76 episodes in. We've done it for a long time now. Um, I, I know that something that I've dealt with is, is you know, in the, while I'm reading the comments and whatnot, is that a lot of people are, are skeptical that anything will actually happen to Trump, that there's ever any accountability. This is one uh, one of those moments where I'm glad something actually did happen because, you know, it's, 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 hard, it's hard for us, I think, if I can speak for you too, to like, do these episodes and uh, and and try to try to insist that the system isn't completely broken all the while watching a system that does seem to be broken. And so this is one of those rare instances where we are uh, validated in a sense. So that's good. Uh, thank God, I, I would say just for myself, just, you know, in terms of people watching and uh, and and listening to us explain that this should be happening any minute now. And then finally it happens. So so that's some rare good news. But can I, yeah, just right. your... I would never tell the people, you know, the, the folks who insisted that Donald Trump will never be held accountable, will never be indicted. You know, I wouldn't say told you so. But what I have been saying all along is, you know, as a former career federal prosecutor, I know how long investigations can take. Now, yeah. I think the feds drag out investigations longer than they have to. But what I've been saying all along is just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't happen. I've believed all along that it will happen. And I have to tell you, I think it's a very good day, not a celebratory day, but a very good day for all law abiding Americans, all Americans who have a respect for the rule of law and have seen Donald Trump violating it in the harsh light of day for so long without any accountability. I think this is a very good day, frankly, for our nation. We'll leave it there. That was perfectly put. So with that said, obviously, we are going to be diving into a lot of of new legal territory here. Uh, we'll cover everything as soon as it breaks. So make sure to subscribe. The links are right here on the screen. I'm Brian Taylor Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.